You're looking at William Blake's Behemoth and Leviathan, which in its way, even though that's not technically an elephant, uh, touches on this elephant versus dragon motif that I talked about in a previous video. The elephant is our real-world behemoth, right? The largest land animal. But it was considered kind of a mythological monster. And so it had these mythological battles, but it was used in real battle. So that's the aspect we're going to focus on today. But do keep that in mind, because it affects uh, soldier psychology, I think, as we'll see. Many times throughout history, an infantryman or a cavalryman was looking up at something that, until that moment, or until that day, he had thought of as a monster from legend. And that's why you get, even as late as the Middle Ages, these uh, wonderfully ridiculous depictions of elephants carrying just enormous towers and sometimes entire castles on their back into battle. Now, it's no surprise that elephants were used in warfare by those who had tamed those beasts, because they are the biggest creature you're going to find, right? They're big, they're strong, sometimes they're very aggressive. Of course, ancient commanders wanted to harness that power if they could. They could do incredible things, just charge through infantry lines, right? Cause absolute chaos. Uh, we're told they could lift up cavalrymen with their horse and toss them in the air. Imagine the effect that sight would have on the rest of the cavalry. It's been said many times that they were the tanks of ancient warfare, which is true. Basically, they were the classic irresistible force. If, and it is a very important if, an elephant wanted to go from point A to point B badly enough, there was nothing an opposing army was going to be able to do to stop it. Here's a couple more of those wonderfully crazy images, and you'll see a lot more if you stick with this video, um, while I talk about the fact that it wasn't all upside. Not at all. Uh, every elephant was a multi-ton double-edged sword. They could, and often did, uh, turn on their own troops in their panic and do absolutely as much, if not more, harm than good to their own side. And we will definitely get into that. But, uh, at a high level, I think that's caused modern scholarship to greatly undervalue the elephant's usefulness. After all, we have a who's who of illustrious ancient generals who saw value in employing them. Uh, speaking of which, this here is a scene from Oliver Stone's movie Alexander. And it shows Alexander the Great running into, almost literally, this piece of standard military equipment from the Near East all the way to Southeast Asia. His incursions into Persia and beyond, that's how the West learned the behemoth was real. They would thereafter be a part of warfare in Hellenistic culture in the Mediterranean uh, for centuries. So how were they used by Greeks, Romans, Macedonians, Carthaginians, that kind of thing? Well, the same way the Indians, Persians, and others had already been using them, mostly as shock troops. Generals wanted to send them in first. You attack your opponent's army with your elephants to soften them up, disorder their ranks, kill some of them, and all before the bulk of your troops have to even get involved. If you're the other side and you don't have elephants, what do you do? Well, here's a very realistic depiction of Carthage versus Rome. And you can see the Romans' light-armed troops up front harassing the elephants. They're first in line, so they have to deal with them. But then the actual heavy infantry in the back opening up lanes to just let them pass through. And then they would send a lot of javelins at them, spears, to encourage them to keep walking. And that tactic was used successfully on multiple occasions throughout history. By Alexander the Great, Scipio Africanus, two of the ancient world's best generals. So, elephants, they could do a lot of damage, they could cause a lot of chaos, but they could be somewhat negated. Even better than negating, though, is reversing. If you can actually get your opponent's elephants to hurt his troops, then great. And you do that by instilling panic, like we talked about. We talked about elephants being the irresistible force. Well, if they decided... That's enough of this, I'm going back the way I came. Or, I'm so mad and in so much pain, I'm just going to start trampling everything I see. There wasn't that much you could do about it. The Mahout, the driver, used an elephant goad, or ancus, like this, to control the elephant. Well, well that's kind of mean, but whatever pain this can inflict on the elephant might end up being dwarfed by what the actual raging battle is doing to him, right? I say him, and by the way, they were, we are told, always male ideally older than their prime as well. You might be surprised by that, but that made them easier to control. Here's a detail on an Ancus, but anyway, we're talking about when the elephants were out of control, and when that did happen, this tool was no good, and the driver had to use a large spike and hammer, driving the chisel into the elephant's brain. Clearly, it was understood then how dangerous they could be to your own side, and yet commanders for, you know, centuries and centuries thought the risk was worth it. And you can see how it'd be so tempting, right? Just so tantalizing. If I can get these things to work the way I want, 
it will equal a tremendous advantage in the battle. But let's start tracing out their history and find some notable examples of uses. Like we said, Alexander the Great, pictured here, uh, first met elephants, as far as someone from the quote-unquote West, and he liked them. He adopted the use of them. His first real fight against them was at the Battle of Hydaspes, around 326-327 BCE. Now you'll see two different images of Alexander wearing an elephant headdress. Obviously that wouldn't work, <laughs> just, you know, size-wise, but the point is the elephant represented power and conquest. As you might know, once he unexpectedly died, several of his generals fought over his empire, and that's when we see the full embrace of the war elephant in the West. And that was the classical world of, like, you know, Macedonia, Greece, Egypt, Babylon, all of his former holdings. Uh, a real high point of effective use coming out of that was at the Battle of Ipsus. This was the ultimate showdown in the Wars of the Successors, as Alexander's uh, would-be heirs, if you will, fought it out. So the Seleucus side, you see them right here, front and center, had supposedly 500 elephants to go up against Antigonus's 75. And that turned out to be the crucial difference, and not for the reason you might think. Antigonus's son, Demetrius, led a successful cavalry engagement, and then was trying to return back to the main battle, but he couldn't get past the Seleucid Elephant Corps. Imagine trying to get around something like 500 elephants. And this is something the ancient sources talk about a lot, not just in this battle. Horses did not want to go up against elephants. Who can blame them? It's not like primal animal kingdom stuff, right? No, that thing is way bigger than I am. Here's another great placeholder image while I talk about this point a little bit more. So the uh, ancient sources say this was especially a problem when horses were new to elephants. Like after a while, after enough battles, they kind of acclimated to the off-putting sight and were told a smell of the elephants. Mini recap, Alexander the Great is the first person from the Mediterranean to encounter elephants. He brings them back, and his successors make them a semi-standard part of warfare. But future superpower Rome was left out of all of this because they were basically the boonies back then as far as the Hellenistic world was concerned. But Alexander's second cousin, King Pyrrhus, changed all of that. So in the post-Alexander world, he took his 20 elephants and his very professional army, here he is by the way, and said, why don't I go conquer that fertile peninsula that we've been ignoring all this time? He was actually asked to invade, but anyway. In the first battle, Heraclea, Roman, the budding Roman power, was therefore encountering elephants for the first time. And they were impressed. Uh, the troops were terrified of them. The horses certainly were. They'd never encountered elephants before. So for the second battle, Rome came up with a bevy of tactics. This is a depiction of the first battle, by the way. So in the second, Rome had these ox-drawn carts that had long, extended weapons, spears, grappling hooks, scythes, you name it, some of them with flaming heads. Basically, these things were giant, flaming porcupines, with men inside firing missiles at you as well. Everything but the kitchen sink. And this kind of brings up an important point about war elephants. Uh, despite how unstable they might be, they really cause your opponent to account for them, right? Like, they really have to change their game because you have this asset. Here's another image depicting Rome versus Pyrrhus, and you can see these soldiers on the right with torches try trying to scare the elephant. Anyway, King Pyrrhus famously lamented that he couldn't keep winning battles like this against the Romans because he couldn't replace his lost men while Rome could, and he moved on to Sicily. And that is why we have the phrase of Pyrrhic victory to this day. Well, he went on to uh, Sicily, by the way, to fight against Carthaginians on the side of the Greeks. And that's interesting because the Carthaginians are our next famous example of elephant use in the Mediterranean. You're looking at Hannibal Barca on an original silver coin, minted during his uh, eternally fascinating and remembered campaign against Rome. That was the Second Punic War, also called the Hannibalic War. However, it was in the First Punic War, starting 264 BCE and going for 23 years, uh, that Rome got their next taste of elephant warfare, because the Carthaginians, a former Phoenician colony in North Africa, relied on them heavily. And as you can see, this was basically a fight over Sicily, the crown jewel of the Mediterranean. Couple of quick points here. Carthage was so into the use of war elephants because that's in North Africa, and that's where one of Alexander's successor kingdoms, the Ptolemaic Kingdom, 
resided, and like we talked about, pretty much all of Alexander's, you know, the post-Alexander kingdoms, what was formerly his territory, used elephants, which he brought back from the east. The naval theater was hugely important in this war, by the way. Just mixing things up uh, picture-wise. Anyway, it was probably the Ptolemaic kingdom that said, you know, we have our own elephants here in Africa, why don't we use them? Now, that was probably more of a result of the supply line being cut off of Asian elephants. This requires a brief explanation. Today we have Asian elephants and African elephants. The African are bigger and stronger, so you would think they were used for warfare, but they weren't. So when you think about ancient elephant warfare, do not think about the kind of elephants you see on safari in South Africa or anything like that. And when you think of people like the Ptolemaic Kingdom or the Carthaginians, you know, people in North Africa using native elephants, it was an extinct species called the African forest elephant. And these were smaller and inferior to the Asian elephant. These then are the ones that Rome went up against in the First and Second Punic War. Here's Hannibal's father, Hamilcar Barca, who was a great general in the First Punic War. And the bottom line in this war is that the Carthaginians had mixed results at best with their elephants. Part of this, if you look at the timeline, is that they were actually kind of just learning the ropes with them themselves. However, they did have notable success at the Battle of Tunis. Rome had invaded North Africa, and a Spartan mercenary was put in charge, Xanthippus. Hamilcar was really the only effective Carthaginian general, but he was too far away. So anyway, Xanthippus... Uh, delivered a crushing defeat in the Battle of Tunis to the Romans, uh, effectively using elephants against the close-packed Roman troops. Rome eventually won the war, though, and once recalled back to Africa, Hamilcar used elephants as part of his arsenal in defeating a mercenary revolt, what's known as the Mercenary War in Carthage. And during that war, if you were one of the insurrectionist mercenaries who was captured, then uh, you could look forward to execution by slow elephant trampling. Ouch. And now on to the Second Punic War. Here's Hannibal, one of the many depictions by artists of him. Uh, he's known as the father of military strategy, uh, one of the greatest generals of all time, and he's the individual most associated with the war elephant in the popular consciousness, I would say. I even did some googling to test that hypothesis, and uh, it pans out. He's the first individual associated with them when you do random searches on ancient war elephants, war elephants, etc. Anyway, that's rather odd because elephants played such a minor role in his legendary campaigns against the Romans. A big part of this is that he led, what would you say, the most famous elephant march in world history, taking his elephants from Cartagena, Spain, to Italy. This involved crossing the Pyrenees just to get out of what we call Spain today. Then he had to cross the Rhone River in a celebrated incident where his men had to build rafts, as you see here, uh, covering them with dirt, basically tricking the elephants into thinking they were standing on solid ground. And, by the way, apparently not realizing that elephants can swim. If this had been done in India, they just would have known, well, we can just ride the elephant across the water. So when one of the elephants fell in, uh, they were astounded to see it just competently complete the journey on its own. And though this breed of elephants with their upbringing probably wouldn't have known to do that. The one that did it just had to because it fell in. Um, because we are told that they were scared of the river. And that's why they had to be coaxed onto the rafts. It was the final stage of the journey, though, that really fascinated people and still does to this day because he crossed these, the Alps, Italy's northern border, considered one of the most daring military exploits of all time. This was not only alien territory, but hostile territory, and it was hostile in terms of nature and natives. Sticking to our focus, imagine these elephants then going through a very inhospitable location, right? One they were not meant to thrive in, and they didn't, but also getting attacked on these narrow mountain passes. Because the Gauls living up in these mountains were not happy about a foreign army traipsing through, and despite their wonder and astonishment at the elephants, they did defend their territory and attack. This vintage illustration actually does a great job of showing the conundrum. You know, you've got a fall to your death on one side, enemies up above you ambushing on the other, and your army is just strung out in this long, narrow line. This here is just the most famous encounter in the mountains, by the way. There were others. Overall, the elephants did not do well with the freezing temperatures and barren, rocky ground. Uh, Hannibal took 37 or 38 with him, and only a few, we don't know how many, but only a few survived the crossing. 
placeholder image time, by the way. So Hannibal's 17-year war against Rome really was a non-entity in the history of military elephants except for that crossing and the final battle in the entire war, the Battle of Zama, which took place back in Africa. This was the final stand where Rome defeated Carthage, and we are told that Carthage mustered 80 elephants to help Hannibal in that battle, but these were inexperienced, poorly trained elephants, and that is a bad idea. You only do that out of desperation. And Carthage, at this point, was desperate, uh, because it was well known. You had to rigorously train elephants for warfare. Uh, trainers went to outrageous lengths. They would pelt them with stones, that's mean, but they would, uh, so they could, you know, get used to the feel of missiles. Uh, they would maneuver them around obstacles, get them used to loud noises, all kinds of things. Which gets us to a point I wanted to make. Elephants were a very costly resource, right? You didn't just capture one and then run it at the enemy in battle. So they eat a lot, they take a lot of upkeep, all this training, very expensive to transport. A lot of these elephants were transported from the Near East. I'm talking about most Hellenistic armies, not Carthages. Uh, but, you know, you don't go to all that trouble for something that turns out to be a liability more often than an asset. Final note on Hannibal, his personal elephant, uh, Surus, was said by some to be an imported Asian elephant, Surus, the Syrian, or from Syria, uh, but not so by others who insist it must have been a native African forest elephant. Uh, bottom line is, we will never know. Well, that was kind of the last hurrah for elephants in Mediterranean Western warfare. Rome obviously became the dominant power in the region, and they were used by Rome. They were used in Spain with very mixed results to try to conquer the people there. Uh, they were used in the Roman Civil War against Caesar. Kind of their shining moment in this latter period was when the Romans used them against the Macedonians. Uh, and that's ironic, because of course that's where Alexander started from. And then Caesar later defeated what's known as the last use of elephants in the Mediterranean in 46 BCE. His 5th legion used axes to attack the legs, we're told, and later took on the elephant as their symbol because of their success. And that was a long-standing tradition, right, going all the way back to Alexander. Hey, I defeated this army that uses elephants, so now I'm going to adopt that as my symbol. Remember him with the elephant headdress. Last little bit on Rome, uh, an elephant was used in the conquest of Britain. The ancient source might or might not have been confused about when this happened, so whether or not it was actually in Caesar's time, but regardless, here we go. Quote, Caesar had one large elephant, which was equipped with armor and carried archers and slingers in its tower. When this unknown creature entered the river, the Britons and their horses fled, and the Roman army crossed over. End quote. So, once again, elephants played their familiar and useful role, terrorizing armies that had never seen one before. You're looking at one of many images we'll rifle through quickly, relating to an episode from 161 BC, where the Seleucids, who we've talked about, uh, invaded Judea, right? Future Israel. And the invaders, of course, brought elephants, because that was a big part of their military. So, we are told Eleazar the Hasmonean, or Averon, uh, went after the largest of the elephants, got underneath, skewered the elephant's underbelly, and brought it down upon himself. A brave act, we're told, is still taught in schools in Israel today. That incident is probably the inspiration for all of these images we're looking at here, and you know how it was with old illustrations. They would recast the story into contemporary imagery, but also fantastical imagery like this, which I absolutely love. This image here is one of my favorites. Uh, you know, there's a, an entire castle on the elephant's back. The elephant looks nothing like an elephant. Notice his trunk here at the bottom. It's basically a tongue, uh, and this all goes back to what I was saying earlier, very early in the video. Elephants are, in a manner of speaking, the only mythical monsters ever used in human warfare. I mean, look at these images. They're from the Middle Ages, centuries after the elephant was seen in Greece, Macedonia, Italy, uh, and they still didn't really understand them or know what they looked like. And as detailed in my uh, Elephants vs. Dragons video, people, even later in the Middle Ages, thought that elephants fought with dragons and manticores and that kind of thing. We also have ample evidence that they thought elephants could carry veritable fortresses on their back, right? Uh, great bleed-through detail here, by the way, on this manuscript with the crucifixion in the background. Anyway, nothing is more exaggerated by ancient and modern art than the towers carried by elephants. One, they were nowhere near as frequently used as you would think, based on artistic depictions. 
the Second Punic War, for instance, uh, there's no evidence that Hannibal or any of the other Carthaginian generals used towers on their elephants, but you will almost always see that in the depictions. And we have detailed descriptions of many of those battles, you know, in a very long war too, right? 16, 17 year war. You'd think somebody would have mentioned them at least once. Now to our second point, look at this picture here. It looks realistic, right? Well, it's not. You cannot fit that many people on top of an elephant. The size of this elephant is greatly exaggerated. Because here's reality. Elephants are big, but they're not that big. We've got three guys with no elbow room to spare. Conceivably, you could add one more row behind them, uh, and even then, you want to talk about tightly packed. These are Cambodian troops from 1952, by the way. We're kind of at the odds and ends section of the video before we pivot to Asia, so let's talk about the Siege of Megalopolis in 317 BCE. The defenders had had their walls breached, which is about as bad as it gets in a siege, right? So they had to make preparations. Well, they put up what wooden defenses they could, right? What defensive works they could, and wisely studded them with nails. This included putting, uh, we're told, planks with nails on the ground. So... Next day, the elephants were in the vanguard, charging. They get to the breaches, try to work their way through, and completely panic and retreat after stepping on the spikes. And the siege failed. Speaking of failed sieges and elephants and anti-elephant weapons, we're told <laughs> supposedly flaming pigs were used uh, to terrify elephants successfully. That was the siege of Megara in 266 BCE. Poor pigs. Uh, and that's not the only time, because supposedly elephants were terrified by the sound of squealing pigs. So I don't know that I buy that. Uh, Pliny the Elder is one of the ones that tells us that. He's also the one that said that elephants and dragons would fight to the death. And anyway, there's assorted episodes. Uh, they all seem rather mythical to me that you can read about. Um, but, you know, if it was effective, I just feel like it would have spread widely and the use of war elephants would have ended abruptly. And that didn't happen, uh, especially in Asia, where it continued to be used and they have pigs as well. Anyway, you've no doubt now noticed the change in picture here. How about that? <laughs> Plate elephant armor. That would be incredibly expensive, but there you go. And here's a Hoda. I don't know how to pronounce that. H-O-W-D-A-H. -H, the elephant tower. How common was elephant armor? Well, it's very difficult to say, but again, that's a big expense. It wasn't often used in the West, it doesn't seem. I think it was more often used in the East. There certainly are very few surviving examples, but here's the best one. And we'll get some real cool uh, close-ups, too. Armor or not, here's the perspective if you're an infantryman facing a charging elephant. So, no thank you. There's that intimidation factor that I think was so alluring for commanders. Elephants, by the way, have naturally thick skin, real thick, so that's good. They have natural protection, but the more pain they endure in a battle, the closer they're going to get to hitting that panic button, which you don't want. So if you could equip them with armor, it would be a good idea. Now, armor did not need to be as extravagant as what we're seeing here. This is really cool to look at, but that's a tremendous amount of work to go to. You could cover an elephant with leather, with quilted cloth, right? Quilted armor was a real thing. There's uh, horse armor like that in Africa. Equipping your elephant, by the way, wasn't just a matter of defense, there was also offense. You're looking at the sleeve here for these tusk swords. Talk about an unusual antique weapon. The tusks had to be cut off so they could be inserted into those sleeves, right? You'd have a flat end instead of the natural point, so that you could use this point instead. And it looks like a karis blade with a heavily reinforced point, if you notice. And that makes sense because these would often be clashing against men in armor. Elephant offense wasn't just about trampling and tusks, by the way. It was also about the trunk, like we covered early in the video, and, of course, the men in the tower. This was an opportunity to shoot at your opponents from a presumably safe position. So there was a ranged combat aspect to the elephant as a weapon. I don't think it was a particularly useful one myself. I think it comes down to the elephants either staying in check and being used as you want or turning on you. If you could have a tower like the one on the right in this image, well, that'd be one thing. If you could have that many missile throwers per elephant. But here's the reality. So maybe if you have hundreds and hundreds of elephants, which was a rarity, that could make a difference. But, you know, if you had 40 elephants on your side, okay, three archers per elephant, it just is not enough to make much of a difference, it seems to me.
I'm going to scroll through a random selection of images, by the way, as I continue talking a little bit. Speaking of the men on top of the elephant, the driver was a prime target for enemy forces, as you can imagine. And this seems to me an incredibly dangerous job. Yeah, you might have a shield, but the enemy, they are just sending a hailstorm of spears your way when you approach on your elephant. And you're only like 10 to 12 feet up, so you're hardly inaccessible. The driver, by the way, had a tough job. The elephant doesn't want to trample enemy troops, because even that is, you know, goes against its nature. So one common tactic, we're told, is feeding the elephants wine. Uh, basically, one elephant expert said they're angry drunks. Of course, the problem is when they're drunk and angry enough that they don't care who they're trampling and they don't care what their driver's directives are. But that just goes back to their infamous, you know, double-edged sword nature as weapons. Uh, here's one of my favorite visuals. In the entire video, and you no doubt recognize the note on Jewish history that it is uh, doing a very bad job of portraying, but it looks great anyway. I said we were going to pivot to Asia, and actually the museum pieces that we've seen so far began that process. So let's talk about how, for one thing, that's kind of out of scope overall for this video, because that's a massive subject in and of itself, but I will touch on it, because that's where it all started and where elephants were used the longest. So enough with the Hellenistic Mediterranean or European medieval art, and on to things like this. You'll see statues like this in Asia because elephants were such a mainstay. One of the academic papers I read in researching this video is called, well, little part from the title here, Dynamics of Prestige and Power Projection. And you can really see that in this image. Now, when we talk about Asia, we're basically talking about India and Southeast Asia. China saw limited use of this mechanism, uh, specifically in the South. So India, you know, if you can hunt a tiger from an elephant, if you can go up against other beasts, why not go up against your enemies in battle? And they did from about the middle of the first millennium BCE all the way to the 18th century. Mythical scene here, by the way. But anyway, uh, you know, these people in the East were not idiots, and this is where I think Western scholars are far too glib in writing off elephants as a useful military implement. Uh, these battles in India and Southeast Asia were for life and death. Uh, they would not have kept using this resource for so long if it just didn't work. And a part of this is geography. Uh, if you live where elephants are really plentiful and just naturally thrive, then you have access to that resource, right? They were used militarily in North Africa until they became extinct. Speaking of how they were used, here's something we haven't talked about too much yet, as basically living battering rams. They could be used effectively this way. Uh, gates in India had to be strengthened and covered with spikes to try to counter that. One of the absolute coolest aspects of elephant warfare in the East is the duel. I hope you're hearing about this for the first time. How about that? Commanders dueling on elephants. And that did actually happen. Maybe not a lot, uh, but there's a celebrated instance from Thailand versus Burma. And it didn't just have to be commanders in a one-on-one -on -one duel either, because, you know, you could have a Mahout with his few soldiers on the back of his elephant clashing against another elephant similarly equipped. So just crazy to think about what a battlefield site these elephant versus elephant clashes must have been. Well, let's fast forward now to the age of gunpowder, because elephants, as you can see here, were used. Now, this seems really surprising to me, because wouldn't an elephant make just a really big target, <laughs> kind of an easy target? But here's the thing. They allowed soldiers to wield guns larger than what they would have if they were on foot, or on horseback for that matter, and fire on troops who basically could not fire back. I'm talking about foot soldiers with their muskets, right? So you're outside of their range, but they're inside of yours. And also, think of like Napoleonic era warfare, cavalry was still an important component, and you could charge ranks of infantrymen, right? Think of them with their fixed bayonets, you know, getting ready to receive a charge. Well, an elephant charging into that kind of group, it's really no different than the ancient warfare equivalent at that point. So here's a picture from Vietnam, the Vietnam conflict. That's how long elephants were still used. And look at that, we're talking modern firearms there. At this point, though, it's because they were still so useful for transportation. They can easily take you through territory that even a jeep cannot. They could also pull really heavy cannons, which was a very useful trait. But are elephants still used today in the 21st century anywhere by a military? Uh, yes, so to speak. This rebel group here in Burma or Myanmar, if you prefer. So, how about that? The poor elephant. Uh, too useful for his own good, I think. Elephant warfare, a really fascinating subject. Pretty much overlooked, I think. Uh treated far too glibly in the West, as I mentioned. Uh, very interesting artistically, if nothing else. 
And you now know how misleading so much of that art is. Let's touch on the Far East very briefly again. They were not very common there, but uh, it's notable that the Mongol army under Genghis Khan and Kublai Khan both went up against elephants when they were invading Southeast Asia. They used catapults and their famous composite bows against them. That's a tactic, the catapult one, uh, that we see elsewhere in the world, by the way. I mentioned that southern China is the only place in China where this you know, use of elephants really flourished. Well, that makes sense, because they had the most commerce with the kingdoms of Southeast Asia. The Southern Han used them to pretty good effect until a battle in 971 AD when the Song Dynasty were used very effectively against them. Uh, speaking of the Far East, um, rockets were used against elephants. They couldn't really do much damage, right? These were not missiles, but the fire, smoke, and noise of them proved to be quite useful against them. Well, there's actually more under the miscellaneous category, but I said I was going to wrap up, so I think I better actually do it now. Uh, elephants in warfare, a fascinating, bizarre piece of history. Uh, this might be the most thorough video on the entire internet about it now, even though I left out the flaming camels, very similar to the pigs, obviously. Uh, the ball and chain flails attached to tusks on Sri Lankan elephants. Sri Lankan and mainland India, more likely. But anyway, hope you enjoyed this. Thanks a lot. Bye.